Joan Blondell was one of the reigning sex symbols of the 1930s. This blue-eyed baby doll sex pot scorched the scene in some of the sassiest classic movies of the 1930s, showing off her shapely assets and sparkling wit. How Joan Blondell's Hollywood career led to her lack of self-esteem? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you're new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. Joan Blondell, a working girl. The bombshell from 91st Street, Joan Blondell. Flushy, often blousy, and intrinsically good humored, Joan Blondell was a Warner Brothers dame of all trades, where she made 54 films over a 10 year period in the 30s, seven with her best partner, James Cagney, and eight with the harder boiled Glenda Farrell. She displayed what she cheerfully called her big boobs and batted her even bigger blue eyes in every variety of Warner Brothers pictures, from comedies to gangster dramas to Busby Berkeley musicals like Footlight Parade, where she memorably tells a rival girl, as long as they've got sidewalks, you've got a job. Joan Blondell was born in Manhattan in New York in 1906. Blondell was literally born in a trunk to vaudevillian parents and was in their act as a toddler. Her first stage appearance was at the tender age of three months old. Her young childhood was spent performing with her parents. Australia, Europe, China, she was on the road most of her young life, pausing in Texas long enough for a spell of semi-traditional family life. She went to 40 or 50 schools for a week, and her family struggled to survive as vaudeville began to slowly down. The Blondells worked a number of odd jobs to help support them in the dying days of vaudeville. By the time she was 17, she'd blossomed enough to enter a beauty contest in Dallas, which she won first place. She used the haul, $2,000, a huge sum in 1926, and used it to help the family get back on its feet financially. Throughout her life, show business wasn't about fame and glory to Joan, it was about making a living. As a young woman, Blondell entered a beauty pageant and weathered a brutal attack by a man who had been promised her favors by the fellow girls in the contest. Trying to escape his car, she broke her ankle. Worse was to come. While working at a library, she was viciously raped by a policeman and kept quiet about it for most of her life. My family needed what I could make. For five people, you gotta make money, even if it's small money. I was mostly grateful to be making it. Rose Joan Blondell learned many things growing up as a child of vaudeville. She learned to make friends easily, to fit in, and to adapt to ever-changing surroundings and circumstances. She learned how to tend to a crew, learn her lines, and enhance the performances of others. She learned to smile on cue and to place the act before everything else. Most importantly, she learned discipline, hard work, and perseverance. The one thing she wasn't taught was how to value herself her gifts, and her own feelings. And that is a lesson lost that caused her much personal happiness. Joan Blondell did not set out to become a movie star. At the beginning, acting was just to help out with her family. When her father's vaudeville act folded in the late 1920s, Joan decided to try and make her own future in the business. My ambition was to make a buck so we could get the act back together again. Her swift climb towards being an invaluable player in the studio's talented stable make for heady reading. She arrives in Hollywood almost simultaneously with the advent of talking pictures with a young Jimmy Cagney, both fresh off a Broadway play that lands on the screen with the racy title of Sinner's Holiday. Blondell, along with Cagney, became workhorses and would go on to make more films together. The title was changed to Sinner's Holiday, and when we first see a brown-haired Blondell, she's referred to as a 10th Avenue cruiser. Blondell already knows how to pop her big eyes even bigger for effect, and she's helplessly likable, so that she can't really play the mean side of her character. In later heroin roles like the alcoholic Aunt Lizzie, Blondell makes constant boozing and ignorance look like honest fun and good sense, respectively. 
Joan's first big break was in a 1929 Broadway show called Maggie the Magnificent, opposite James Cagney. The two became friends, and Cagney, who had been married since 1922, said that she was the only woman other than his wife that he ever loved. Working her way up the Warner's ladder in endless gritty programmers, Blondell developed crack comic timing as she dished out pre-code dialogue, often in her underwear. In William Wellman's Other Men's Women, she tells her many admirers that she's APO, which she translates as ain't putting out. Blondell played girls on the make who were somehow decent, and she became a classic wisecracking heroine for the 1930s. What stands out most about Blondell's style is her lack of self-consciousness. She has one scene in Three on a Match where she's hooked up to a monstrous metal hairdressing machine in a beauty parlor. Stuck there for a while in extreme close-up with little makeup on, Blondell offers herself to the camera with no protectiveness, as if she's saying, Well kids, here I am. Gee, my feet hurt, but what are you gonna do? There's a depression on. Opposite an impassioned Cagney on Blonde Crazy, Blondell jiggles around and drives him nuts. She's like an amiable, sexy cartoon goldfish. But there was endless drudge work for her. Every good film like Blonde Crazy and Trooper Blondell was never a complainer or a fighter for better parts like her fellow Warner's inmate, Betty Davis. It was hard, hard labor and gruesome hours, Blondell later said. The biggest treat was when you got off time to go to the bathroom. Later on, Cagney stuck up for her usually wasted gifts. She could have done much better things than the roles the studio gave her. The proof is in a movie like Gold Diggers of 1933, where Blondell's emotional immediacy and frank romantic sexuality come through very intensely during her scenes with Warren William. But in the middle and late 30s, Warner Brothers threw her into nothing but formula films, knowing that she would give them her all regardless. Blondell often emphasized that her home and family were more important to her than any acting work, but her private life was rocky. During her first marriage to cinematographer George Barnes, he insisted she have several abortions to her increasing heartbreak. Finally, she refused to terminate her last pregnancy and she had her first son, Norman. Blondell had her daughter Ellen with her second husband, crooner Dick Powell, and she reached the height of her popularity during her marriage to him, even though none of her films from the middle to late 30s were really first-rate. Her working conditions remained absurd. Once, when Blondell was too ill in bed to come to work on I've Got Your Number, Warners ordered the crew to report to her house, and the writers were told to compose a sickbed scene climax to the film. In a letter to producer Hal Wallace, Blondell let her fatigue be known. Imagine yourself eating the same meal over and over again, accompanied by the same people and the same small talk calling for the same small answers from yourself. After about the sixth meal, you would become pretty weary and your answers would cease to have any life to them whatsoever. Her plea for new material and directors fell on deaf ears. By the mid-40s, Blondell had broken away from Warners and signed with 20th Century Fox, where she gave her finest performance as Aunt Sissy in Elia Kazan's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Blondell's lack of inhibition in front of the camera makes her a world-class actress under Kazan's direction, and she lavishes all her warmth and energy on this perfect aunt, a simple, good-hearted, happy hedonist who enjoys her popularity with men and says to try everything once. She followed this triumph with an even better movie, Edmund Golding's Nightmare Alley, playing a former vaudeville headliner, a decent trooper who is nonetheless ruled by her lustful appetites, the dark side of Aunt Sissy. Blondell made this movie during her third and last marriage, a full-scale disaster with the theatrical producer Mike Todd. Todd's paranoia and jealousy and his brutal rages. After one fight, Todd even poisoned Blondell's dog. He went through most of her money, and when he was done with her, he gave some of Blondell's jewelry to his last wife, Elizabeth Taylor. Blondell gave up on men after this catastrophe, and she found work scarce in the 50s, though she managed to be hilarious with not-too-funny material in Frank Tashlin's Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter. She did a lot of TV and endless bus and truck theater tours, scoring a particular success as William Inga's faded Lola in Come Back Little Sheba, an ideal role for her. In her last years, Blondell continued trooping even under the strain of crippling rheumatoid arthritis. 
Outlandish as it may seem in retrospect, she had her final hurrah in a John Cassavetes movie, Opening Night, one of his large, mysterious Gina Rowland's epics. Joan Blondell was illustrative of the strengths of the Hollywood studio system, never getting the Sacco starring vehicles of contemporaries like Barbara Stanwyck and Joan Crawford, Blondell nonetheless carved out a memorable career over half a century. She was one of the most reliably good actresses, yet she was rarely showcased and never won a major award. Joan Blondell appeared in more than 100 movies in a career that spanned half a century. Radio drama, short films, feature films, television shows and drama, theater performances, all, Joan did them all. Nearly 60 of these movies were shot in the 1930s in an astonishing average of more than five screen appearances per year. This retrospective attempts to capture some of this metamorphosis as seen in her roles for Elia Kazan, Edmund Golding and John Cassavetes. Though she often worked with inferior material in forgettable films, Blondell remained prolific throughout her career. She once said, without work, what is life? She embodied a spirit that was quintessentially cinematic and American to the core. During the 60s and 70s, Blondell was reduced to second-rate movie roles. In 1965, however, the National Board of Review, in a belated gesture to her long career, voted her the year's best supporting actress for her minor role in The Cincinnati Kid. At the end of her career, Blondell became discouraged by the quality of scripts that were sent her way, calling them pointless, rotten, and unnecessary. She always retained a down-to-earth outlook on Hollywood and never took herself too seriously. Admitting that she was never terribly comfortable being on display, she spent the last years of her life living in New York City, pursuing interests she felt she had finally earned the right to enjoy. She was known around Hollywood as a studio dame, the ultimate working girl, always professional, never complaining, and accepting the roles she was offered. Unlike other Warner Brothers actresses like Betty Davis and Olivia de Havilland, who fought tooth and nail for their roles, Blondell was open about her lack of ambition. I enjoyed a home life more than a theatrical career. I just took what they gave me because I wanted to get home quickly. Privately, she was unerringly loving and generous, while her life was touched by financial, medical, and emotional upheavals. Joan died of the blood cancer disease called leukemia. She quietly passed away on Christmas Day. There is no indication that Joan suffered before her demise. In her last year on Earth, she appeared in three films and one television series. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're new here.